The Ironman Pro Series has officially arrived, beginning at the Athletic Brewing Ironman 70.3 Oceanside. Now, I'm Matt Lieto, and you might be used to hearing me on the live broadcast or even messing around on a motorcycle at the World Champ races, but we're going to try something new here and do a look back at the great racing at the Athletic Brewing Ironman 70.3 Oceanside and take a little deeper dive into the race as it developed and maybe look at racing in a little different way than we have before. Now, both pro fields were stacked and it proved to be a great day of racing. Here's a look at the entire Ironman Pro Series schedule that runs from April through December, culminating at the VinFast Ironman 70.3 World Championship. In total, there are 20 broadcasts, eight Ironman and 12 Ironman 70.3 races taking place across nine countries. But today we are at the Athletic Brewing Ironman 70.3 Oceanside, often looked at as the unofficial start of the professional racing season this year. It's the official start of the Ironman Pro Series and everybody showed up. You can see the athletes pretty excited, getting ready, got their call-ups ready to go. Even Braden Curry throwing a little dab there. Uh, but people were excited to get the season started as usual, but a little bit more excitement around the Ironman Pro Series and you could feel it in Oceanside. Some of those big names were Sam Long, Jackson Laundry, Yelly Heens, Patrick Langa, Joe Skipper, Florian Angert, Chris Leiferman, Matt Hansen, Matt Sharpen on the women's side, Taylor Nib, obviously favorite coming in, Vanilla Langridge, Paula Finley, Emma Pallant Brown, Tamara Jewett, defending champ, Grace Tech, Lisa Bacharas, and Grace Alexander. So, no doubt, a deep field and a field that was ready to fight for those points. Because the forecast was for rough seas, the Roka swim course was moved back into the harbor, which has been used many, many times at Ironman 70.3 Oceanside. And it's a tough swim. It, you know, it looks easy. It's tranquil looking, but it's cold, very cold. And it's also like pretty narrow. So for whatever reason, it ends up being a pretty big fight in the water. Uh, you know, I've had swims there where you're fighting for almost 500 meters. So point being, it can really turn things upside down. Sometimes our favorites don't have great swims. They lose time. And sometimes the people that we know are gonna lose time, lose a bunch of time. And you know, pretty quickly, four athletes separated themselves from the rest of the field. And there were two kind of chase groups behind, a smaller one and then a larger one. And then when they came out, we knew that it was Magnus Manor that was leading that group with Matt Sharp, Mark Dubrick, and Florian Angert. You know, and then there was you know some groups about 30 seconds behind. Justin Reale was in that second group. Matt Schaefer, Yelly Heens, importantly, was in that second group. And Patrick Langa was just behind that. And then it, the big kind of surprise was Lionel Sanders was only a minute and a half back. And when we saw that, when I saw that split, I literally said he just won the race. That's how important it is. And I guarantee you those athletes running into transition, hearing Lionel's name within 60 seconds or 90 seconds of them coming out of the water, there was uh, there was some, some maybe some negative self-talk at that point. And on the women's side, it was Taylor Nib and Fenella Langridge that separated themselves pretty quickly from the rest of the field. Kate Curran was in there as well, but it was mostly Taylor Nib and Fenella Langridge going swimming side by side for a lot of it. But, you know, I love seeing the the grit of Fenella Langridge kept moving in front whenever she could. Uh, but those two, you know, I would say battled, but no contact, but they were definitely pushed the pace at the front of the swim with Kate Curran and getting about a minute on the rest of the field coming into transition. As athletes moved through transition, no doubt they were getting splits as who was in front, who was in back. Lionel Sanders took a little bit of time uh, getting everything together to get out onto the full gas bike course. And Sam Long definitely took advantage of that, brought back 40 seconds of the gap that he had to that group with Lionel in it. So made his job a little bit easier to bridge up. And the importance of the early section of this bike ride at Oceanside, I can't really uh, express enough how important it is. It's just so fast. There's a little kicker, pretty like a half mile out of transition that, that can break things up. But besides that, it's super fast, a couple turns, but you really, really want to be near a bunch of other athletes if possible, riding legally, of course, but at high rate of speed, you know, you're probably going to get a little bit of an advantage, certainly motivation of getting everybody together. And, and you want to catch that front of that group as fast as you can, but without spending all your energy because it's a faster section of the course. You want to save that for the tougher section. So, you know, Yelly Heens is the athlete that, that bridged up to the very front of the group. He was 30 seconds back out of the water and he pushed that pace. And he did so because he, as well as the rest of us, knew that he needed to stay in front of what was gonna be a massive train of athletes of good, 
good riders, Sam Long, Jackson Laundry, Lionel Sanders. He needed to stay in front of them as long as possible to try to get to the difficult sections of the course where his size might allow him to keep up, where on the fast, fast section, it's just going to be too hard for a guy like Yelly. And, and he did a great job, but you could see at that out and back, he knew it wasn't enough. And man, when those groups come together, it could be total chaos. And I want to say Sam Long did a great job. You know, we saw him obviously the, being the one at the front when these groups bridged up or came together and he's smart. He doesn't want to be in any of that chaos. He went straight to the front and around all the athletes. And then as soon as he got in the front, what did he do? He pushed the pace. And that is so important because some athletes might think, okay, it's going to come together. It's going to settle down a little bit, or maybe they're just in the wrong spot as the groups come together and they can miss out. And one of the athletes that ended up missing out when these groups came together was Braden Curry, who's who's one that could, could certainly be on the podium of this race. And then he had to ride in no man's land. Yelly Heens also missed out on that connection when they came together. And, and that's probably why Sam really pushed that pace afterwards. And that's really just such a, such a smart move by Sam and those other athletes that were heads up uh, when they were riding in that group. And then once that, that group was broken up, you know, there were just five athletes left and the tactics become interesting because you can tell Sam really wanted to push that pace. He wanted to make sure they got around two minutes or over two minutes on Yelly to make sure they could, could have a gap on the run they were comfortable with. And then you got to think, do I need to push so I can drop Jackson and Lionel or do I just keep riding a pace that I think is going to keep us away from Yelly? But clearly Sam attacked a few times, really put a lot of effort in and was continually brought back. So a lot of these athletes really pushing that pace. And I will say I did a little bit of looking some investigating and Justin Reale, one of the athletes that was in that group of five who I think had his breakthrough race great job for him to be able to stay in that front group get a gap on the run but he normalized 317 watts it's a lot of watts Yelly Heens averaged 290 normalized 260 average so definitely the hills were something he took advantage of but still lost a fair bit of time and Jackson Laundry was 324 normalized watts, 310 average. That is a ton of watts. For those athletes, roughly, it's about 4.8 watts per kilo for the two that had the, the faster times. And word on the street is Sam had one of his best power numbers ever for 70.3. And I'm guessing Lionel Sanders was right around 350 looking at the, the pace and the effort that he put in for that day. So huge, huge numbers for these athletes. And then coming into transition, no matter what Sam tried, those five stayed together. But the question was who had the legs for the run and how far back was Yelly Yeans? It was Spinella Langridge and Taylor Nib coming into transition together. And Taylor Nib not known for fastest T1 in 70.3 racing. She does put socks on. It works for her. That's great. You know, rumor is she was a little bit worried this week that her new coach, uh, Dan Lorraine, didn't really know exactly how much time she was going to lose in T1. Uh, but in the end, I don't think she was that worried about it. But you could see Penelope Langridge get out nice and quick. And Taylor taking her time. Lost a minute. So ended up being a little bit closer uh, of a gap to Paula Finley. Uh, then maybe the swim deficit should have allowed uh, Grace Tech not too far behind. Grace Alexander, Brittany Vock, all pretty close behind. Emma Pallant Brown lost three minutes in the swim to Paula Finley. Uh, so a little bit of gap that she had to make up uh, to be able to be a part of this bike ride. But <sighs> it was pretty tough for any of these women to really do anything of note against Taylor Nib. The biggest thing for me is the first 12 miles of this bike course, Taylor Nib made up two minutes and 20 seconds on Fenella Langridge, Paula, and Emma. Two minutes and 20 seconds on the faster section of the course. That's effectively much harder to get a gap like that. And that's just insane. And I think that that's a lot of things. You know, looking at numbers, my guess is that she averaged around 260 watts for the 70.3. She doesn't make her watts public, but it's, it's that aerodynamics. We can see how smooth her position is, how she spends that energy. I'm sure she wasn't riding the hardest she rode all day in that first 12 miles. So impressive that she was able to make up that much time. And, and to me, then it opened things up and it was a race against the rest of the women. And, you know, we saw Fenella Langridge fighting well, but we did see Paula Finley catch Fenella, you know, kind of when it got close to the hills. And, and what I think is crazy is just how impeccable Paula's pacing is. Fennell outrode Paula Finley by 
10 seconds in the first 40K. In the next 20K, which is when it started getting hilly, Paula closed in a minute and 45 seconds. That's crazy. That's, that's spending the, the energy and the watts at the right time in the hills. You know what's even crazier? And I didn't know this, and then I looked, and now I'm like shocked. Taylor Nib put 315 into Paula. So she obliterated the field on that hilly section. And that's an athlete that knows where to spend the energy and the efficiency, and then she's got that aerodynamics to stay nice and smooth in that aero position on the faster sections of the course. Unbelievable. I think it's super impressive though. Fenella fought, stayed with Paula. The rest of the bike ride really had to fight over that climb to stay with her, but she did. And then Emma Pallant, Brown, she's had a lot of bad luck inside racing and outside. Uh, had a crash uh, not too long ago, was injured, wasn't sure if she'd get to the start line. Went off course. I was told she lost about 10 seconds on the bike ride because of that. But man, she was moving. She was absolutely moving by herself in no man's land all day. And, you know, she had a great bike ride that put her into fourth place. So we saw Paul and Fanella come in at 1045 down, then Emma at 12 and a half minutes down. And Danielle Lewis had a great ride to come in 14 minutes down. But that is a big gap coming into T2. And no doubt coming through transition, these athletes were on it. It was it was definitely a little bit of chaos. There was almost a sprint. Uh, you know, some of the athletes, Justin Reale, I think he wanted to let those guys go to a certain extent, but everybody else was battling to get to that run first. Sam was the most efficient. He's been great in transitions, and he knew he wanted to, to put himself at the front to make Lionel chase, to make Jackson chase. And if he could play a card in this poker match that at times is a 70.3 run to make those athletes think that he just had it and maybe he's going to run away. And if he gets five seconds, they're going to give him another five. But he goes to the front, pushes the pace, but Lionel knows he's played a lot of these poker matches and and he takes Jackson with him. Jackson had a hard time hanging on, but they bridged up to Sam. And then Lionel, no doubt, is remembering these side-by-side -side battles that he's had with Sam before in St. George, side-by-side -side for so much of the run and then a sprint finish that nobody wants to have to do. So he's definitely thinking about that. Doesn't want that to be uh, on the table. He respects Sam too much for that. But then he goes to the front and pushes and, and drops Jackson. And, and he's also thinking, man, two years ago, Jackson had his breakthrough. And that guy had the gall to put in efforts to drop Rudy Von Berg and Alistair Brownlee. You got to be confident to do that. He did it, won the race with Lionel in a sprint finish closely behind. But he's like, man, I don't want to give this guy any room. He's smart. He's gutsy. If He's a great athlete. So he goes to the front and pushes that pace and just slowly, slowly started to break those athletes behind. And you never want to run against Lionel Sanders ever because that's hard. But man, if if you're if everybody's at their limit and Lionel's at the front, you know he's gonna hurt himself more than you're capable of hurting yourself. So Lionel's up there and he's pushing that pace out and back. He sees it, he's gonna show how much he's hurting because that's almost even more intimidating. And that run gap just kept opening up. And, and they could see on the out and backs then that uh, Yelly Heens was far enough back that he wasn't gonna be able to bridge up two and a half minutes down. So I think Lionel started seeing that he was gonna be able to win this race, but then it was that battle behind and Jackson Laundry just could not hold off Sam. Sam's had two great races this year where his run has really shined and he's just a strong strong athlete on this course you have to be a super strong athlete and they all had great runs but sam was able to get in front of jackson trying his best to hope crossing his fingers that lionel sanders was playing a poker card that uh you know he was going to fold eventually but he did not and watching lionel come down that finish shoot you can see just how important it was for him to get a win that he hasn't had since 2017 in Oceanside. And then he's a prideful athlete, and I don't think he's necessarily been that stoked on his last few 70.3 races, and he kind of wiped the slate clean. And more importantly, starting the Ironman Pro Series with max points. Sam Long behind him, not too far behind, so doesn't lose too many points. And Jackson Laundry coming across in third place. Fourth place was Yelly Heens with a great run to move himself up all the way to fourth place and then fifth place was one of our standout athletes for today maximilian spurl so great great run by those five athletes no surprise taylor nib was out of transition first and out onto the run and, and she makes it look easy you know she's got a lot of running history at three different distances now being an ironman world championship last year 
obviously ITU distance racer going to the Olympics uh, in Paris in the summer in a few months. So she's just metronomic. You know, she looks great. She looks super smooth and knows that she has a gap. You know, she was pretty concerned in T2 about if she had that bike course record. So she was definitely riding hard. Don't worry, Taylor, you tied it 218 flat with Daniela Reef. So great performance on the bike, but now on the run, just running really smooth. But the story was certainly the women behind because the win was was gone in, in all reality. And, you know, Paula Finley and Fenella Langridge coming off the bike together. You know, clearly Fenella was pushing the pace a little bit harder to, to hold on to Paula and Paula got a little gap in a transition and, and again, very tactical. You want to break the athletes early and she had about five seconds, but coming out of transition, Fenella dropped, uh, a, it looked like a bag, maybe that she had gels in or something like that, uh, coming out of transition and she hesitated for a second, but turned around, grabbed that. She wanted to make sure she didn't lose what she had and wanted to make sure she, you know, maybe wasn't penalized if a ref saw her, um, drop something and not pick it up. But you know, I think in the end, that might have been a, a blessing because trying to hang on to an athlete that's on a better day is just is just challenging. Certainly on the run, you want to settle into your own pace to have your best run. And I think this forced her to kind of let the pace come to her a little bit. But it wasn't too far behind uh, coming off the bike that Emma Pallant Brown, you know, was just a minute and 45 seconds behind Vanilla Langridge. And that's going to be hard to hold off. And once we saw Emma running, it's just... It's amazing. She looks so smooth. It looks effortless. And it just shows what a pure runner looks like. And I think her strength is really underrated on these rolly courses. You know, this course has a lot of ups and downs and they're very steep and, and she makes them look effortless. And no doubt she was gonna bring back some athletes. And it was just a question of how many. You know, she wasn't gonna bring back Taylor Nib, obviously, but pretty soon she brought back Fenella Langridge. And as they're going through that out and back section, I think she could tell pretty quickly that she was gonna be able to bring back Paula Finley as well and just kept moving. Ended up having the fastest run of the day with a 118, but looked great all the way throughout. Paula Finley also had a good run, nice and steady. You know, she might've wanted to be able to have a little bit more to answer to Emma Pallant Brown, but you know, now she's third place behind two women that have obviously podiumed at the 70.3 World Championships very good racing from Paula Finley and that was kind of it nothing really changed too much after that Grace Tech made some moves through the field but in the end it was all Taylor Nib and she made it look easy I'm sure it wasn't but she said before the race that she hasn't really nailed the 70.3 distance yet and from what I hear she still doesn't think that she did and she still won by 11 minutes so that's scary the big question is how do you beat Taylor Nib I think maybe you sabotage the socks, make them too hard to put on, get more time and transition, but it's going to be a hard one to beat. She gets 2,500 points for the Ironman Pro Series. Second place, Emma Pallant Brown. Third place, Paula Finley. Fourth, Grace Tech. And fifth place with a great bike run combo was Danielle Lewis. Well, there you have it. The first race in the Ironman Pro Series, the Athletic Brewing Ironman 70.3 Oceanside. I'd say lived up to the hype delivering a bunch of excitement. And in this series, every second matters. And the next Ironman Pro Series race is on April 27th, the Memorial Hermann Ironman North American Championships in Texas, part of the VimFast Ironman North America Series. Some of the top pros that will be there, Patrick Langa, Cody Beals, Cap Matthews, Vanilla Langridge, just to name a few. Watch live on proseries.ironman.com, Outside TV, DAZN, and Lay Keep Live.